The name of the restaurant Savoy, the corner is Crosby and Prince, the neighborhood Soho. I want you to go back in time, like way back in time, like you know, almost a couple of hundred years. This is one of the oldest tiny little buildings, and this, well, you know what that is. We'll get the story on how this once barber shop turned into really one of my favorite restaurants in New York now. The chef Peter Hoffman, real early pioneer with market-driven uh, menus, market-driven ingredients, longtime advocate of shopping at Union Square. I've been a fan of this restaurant for years. I love it. It's one of my favorite in the city. All the food tastes great. There's a lot of thought behind it. He's an interesting guy. He comes from a kind of a different branch of the New York restaurant school than most of us did and I love him for that so we're gonna go inside see what Peter's about check out the great food welcome to Savoy stay where you are we're not going anywhere well, what can I say that I didn't say outside? Savoy's one of my favorite little restaurants in the city. I've eaten here over the years, I don't know how many times, dozens, lots of times in the middle of the day when it's not that busy and they're serving those small plates. It's a cuisine that's informed as much by Peter's intellect as it is by his great judicious choice of ingredients. He's one of the early market-driven chefs. He was there a long time ago, shopping in Union Square, cooking in season, and just keeping it really simple. This is the first time I've been in his kitchen, and the one thing you're going to see that I learned from being in the kitchen is actually how simple the food is. Seems more complicated on the plate and in your mouth, but it's really simple. Peter Hoffman, chef, owner, restaurant, Savoy. Let's come inside. You're going to enjoy this one. A little herb oil. I'm always looking for the opportunity to tell a story beyond just what the dish is. And so um, whether it's this is the history of this dish and we're doing it in a um, traditional manner or here's what the traditional dish was but we did a slight tweak on it because of where we are um, or to tell the story of this is how this ingredient was grown or procured or gathered or whatever because those are stories that we've lost in our culture if people don't go out to farms, they don't grow their own food, they don't have gardens, um, they're out of touch. They, it, We've they, lost what that they, connection. They've lost the yeah. connection. And so, so much of what we've done um, here at Savoy is to try to make that connection clear for people. Okay, so this dish is the uh, Montauk Fluke, poached in brodetto, which is basically Italian for broth. It's uh, saffron, uh, root vegetables, which we use parsnip and celery root and some wonderful uh, russet potatoes. Um, every week we have um, several whole small pigs get delivered to us. And, and so we're using the whole pig. We're basically going to butterfly the pig, remove the rib cage, remove the leg and thigh bones, and open it wide open. Gotcha. And then we're going to split it in half and uh, add some crushed garlic and fresh herbs and things like that and actually roll the belly around the loin. So this is the finished uh, product, the suckling pig roulade. As you can see, well, we've redistributed the muscles into the center of the loin here so it has a nice even consistency and it's tied together so it uh, you know, maintains its shape. You know, and that, that's, that's one <clears throat> example of something that's really expressive of our philosophy here that, that, that over the years, one of the ways that what's available to us has changed is that there are um, local animals and small high quality producers um, that, that was never there before. Um, it was just vegetables, it was just the green market. There wasn't even a cheese maker there. And now there's all these proteins, there's chickens and pigs and lamb and all that stuff that um, uh, we have access to that, that didn't exist before. So we take the suckly pig roulade and we just gently place it into the fryer. And this is going to help uh, crisp the skin. We're not initially cooking the roulade at this point. We're just trying to get the skin crisp, lock in the moisture, and then we're gonna continue baking it here in the oven uh, for about 20 more minutes. The press is always looking for hooks and what's the new trend and so that this term, you know, market-driven cuisine, which became so popular just a couple of years ago. You were doing this 15 years ago, going to Union Square, this sort of thing. And, and so, I mean, you, you were really one of the pioneers of a movement that had no name then. Right. Right. It's just what we did. Yeah. You can't have a great cuisine or you can't have great food unless you're starting with great products. Oh. And, um, and so you see that in France, you, you know, it's just like, 
you, you go to a fish market in Paris and it's just like, it's extraordinary because they're driving that fish in a truck that got caught in Normandy or in Brittany and they're bringing it to, to Paris the next day. There's, yeah. no, there's no lag time. They wouldn't stand for anything else. They, everything is on a smaller scale there. So, you, you know, how wide is the street? How big is your apartment? How big is your refrigerator? So how much food can you put in that fridge? Well, if you have a, you know, if you have a sub-zero and you can go box. and you can have two weeks worth of food, well then it doesn't really matter whether it's fresh or not fresh or how long it's in there. But if you're working with a half fridge, you know, um, under your work table, you're going to go to the market every day because it's just downstairs and around the corner. Slicing the sausage, make it nice for presentation. You can see, you know, lovely uh, fat content in there. I think our pork is uh, of top quality here and we can serve it in the medium range. A little salad and finishing off here, this is a little uh, dried apricot and brandy mustard just to try it all together. I just had a conversation with a guy in the in in, in the kitchen, and was sort of about. Um, I, I, I he didn't know what kind of apple he was working with, and I picked up the apple, the core, basically to eat it and say what I what kind of apple I thought it was. And he goes, I said, Oh yeah, I've eaten a lot of apples. He says, Why have you been to apple tastings? I go, I haven't been to apple tastings. I've been eating apples. You know, it's like I go to the green market several times a week, and I'll go around and you know be excited. So it's like I know what a stamen looks like, a wine sap, a northern spy, a golden russet, a and, and when And when and they're then, great and, then, and when they start to exactly. get mushy and turn to sponge. Exactly. And, and that's so, three weeks sometimes. And, and it's that relationship, that time that I've spent in the market with farmers, with producers who say, I, I mean, I, just on the apple time, it's like I remember a, a, an orchard is coming up to me and she was cutting apples for everybody in the market. And she says, I got a, I got a, um, I got a Cortland for you, and I was like, eh, "I'm not into Cortlands, man. I'm into I'm into heritage apples, you know. Kind of. I mean, that was the, yeah, yeah, that yeah. was the subtext." And she's like, "Oh no, 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 no! Check it out. Check it out. Because when I grew up, there were no Galas and Fujis yet, but Cortland was one of the mainstay apples in all the supermarkets um, in New York. And and I was like, "Ah, eh, Cortlands, you know." But but it was because of how Cortlands had been handled and treated. They were sitting out in a warm grocery store for three months before anybody ate it. So she's like, here at Cortland, it's just like, wow, man, this is a good eating apple, this is a good baking apple, this is, this is a workhorse. And it was, it's like historically, it was the workhorse of New York. And, um, and so to, to learn that, learn that story, reappreciate or begin to appreciate all those subtleties, that's what we're doing. Savoy, you know, I love this place. Um, this whole story of it, you know, 1920s building, this part of Soho, you know, back the Soho, you know, think of it today is like, you know, Gucci and Prada and billion dollar, you know, it was an in light industrial manufacturing district, really is what it was at its inception. It was known as the Thousand Acres of Hell. That's what Soho was called, that was his nickname. South of Houston, Houston was a horrible street. Um, never properly maintained by the city. And Soho was this light industrial, and there would there'd be fires and fire trucks couldn't get down those little lanes. I mean, it was just this really funky part of New York City. And I just, I just want to go back in a day. It's you know, like, well, like a Scorsese movie, you know, Gangs of New York. And there's my shot. This was a barber shop in 1920. And you could still see that red and white striped thing in the corner. Um, barber shop, barber shop. Up until the 1920s, then it becomes a, a, a diner, until Peter picks it up. And, you know, he was really one of the earliest guys here in New York City to start going to those markets as just part of his thing. You know, he, like I said, he's part of that funny tradition of Jewish intellectual chefs in this town. Guys like Barry Wine, guys like David Waltock, Bobby Pritzker. Um, smart kid, real, just came out of left field. And I've always liked that restaurant because the food tastes good. You know, I'd never been in the kitchen before until we did that shoot, never stepped foot into that kitchen. But I come by a lot, a lot of times mid-afternoon, because they do that little plates, you know, the small plates menu plus lunch. And I'll come by, the windows are open in the summer, it's three in the afternoon, I just, I'm sitting there, I guess the kitchen's still open, get a couple of snacks. Per, always the food was spot on, and that's what impresses me most about that restaurant. What I was amazed about is how tough the kitchen was. First time I was in that kitchen, I'm like, 
what? <laughs> this food comes out of that kitchen? Not that it's dirty or anything like that. No, no. It's just so hard. The layout is so hard. It's just like all, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. I mean, you know, people got cutting boards on, on wire racks to do mise en place. Uh, there is no prep area, formal prep area. Just a little L-shaped thing where, where we were doing the porchetta. That's the only place you can do place. Um, just work all over the place. It's like working on a boat, you know, got a, little, got a little shelf here, Harry, just batting down the hatches and chopping. That's how they make that food. And the other thing I saw, which is neat, and that's why I love doing this show, and these guys letting me into their kitchen, is the food in your mouth, the food on the plate, seems more complicated because it tastes great and it's, there's a lot going on, a lot of thought, a lot of texture, a lot of flavor. A lot of, but then you get in the kitchen and say, whoops, you say, holy mackerel, that was simple. I mean, wait a second, David Waltox does the same stuff. I've been in David Waltox's kitchen at Chanderelle and some of the dishes, and I'm like, that's it? I mean, no A, B, C, that, that, two, three, what? So, <laughs> with that in mind, I'm coming out of Savoy thinking, what am I going to make? And I'm, what I'm going to do, simple stuff, market stuff. It's, it's winter now. It's, you know, we're shooting. It's 2007. We shot that in, in December. We're still cooking in December for this. And um, there are no leafy vegetables left. If you go to the market, went to Union Square. It's a Wednesday. I got root vegetables. These are winter vegetables. Celery root, which I love. Uh, a turnip. Got a little funny hole in it. We'll have to peel that out. Turnips, uh, parsnips, and carrots. And here's something I've been doing, and I've been doing this at home, this is truth. I kind of got this idea a long time ago from watching Ducasse, and I've kind of run with the ball a little bit. I've been doing this a lot at home as a vegetable side dish for protein. And that, and I think I just did this once out of like laziness, because I was like watching the news or listening to me or something. I'm gonna get these vegetables, peel them, cut them into a nice medium dice, medium to large dice. No onion, no garlic, no standard stuff, just these root vegetables in a pan with some oil. I might use grapeseed oil today. Um, and I'm just going to sweat them, meaning no color. So I'm just going get, to get that pan warm, and then I'm going to put a lid on the pan and just let it form steam, because the steam's going to, you know, the vegetables are mostly liquid. As that liquid tries to escape, it's going to hit the walls of the pan and then that, the lid and go back down again. I'm going to just sweat these vegetables out. No color, no caramelization. That's what I used to do. Still do it sometimes, but I've been doing this a lot. Lid on the pan, just let those vegetables kind of steam on down, let them sweat. You get a lot of flavor that way. Salt, pepper. Um, I got a fish, my protein's black bass. I was trying to get some striper, but I didn't, they, there was none in the market. So I got a nice little black bass. This is a gorgeous fish. This is really one of my favorite fish on the East Coast. Real delicate, really sweet, really, really one of the great East Coast fish. Swims out there a few miles deep down, likes wrecks. You know, black bass fish, I'm always looking for shipwrecks. That's where these things swim around the wrecks. But I love this fish. So, Real simple dinner. This is the kind of stuff I've been eating a lot lately. So a big pile of these root vegetable ragu that are just sweated down. Again, no color. I'm doing that on purpose. And it's so easy to do because you can put a lid on the pan. You turn the flame all the way down, like to low, 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 and just walk away. Come back in five minutes. They're getting there. Salt, pepper. We'll finish out with a little bit of olive oil. Great extra virgin. A turn of the pepper milk. And I'm thinking, too, just for a twist on this one, at the end, I want a little acidity. I want a little sharpness. I'm going to put a little bit of San Marzano tomatoes. Pull them out of a can. And um, squeeze the juice out and just kind of rough chop. We got these great San Marzanos here. We were in Italy filming. Got a great can of tomatoes here. These are the ones that we filmed that are beautiful. They're just great. They're, the flesh, you saw that show. The flesh is real thick. Um, it's not that watery California pack, which you're fine for tomato sauce. But in this, I just want for acid. I could use lemon juice, but I'm going to use tomatoes. I'm going to finish with little t tomatoes and some chopped olives. So I've got this vegetable ragu with tomato and olive for a little acidity and brightness, the earthiness of the vegetables and that minerality. And then the fish will saute it skin side crisp and just put one side flesh up, skin side up, dinner, piece of bread, pepper, salt. So let's get started with the vegetable prep. Um, and well, this is exciting peeling carrots. I want some chunk. I want some heft to these things. I want to I want to know I'm eating a carrot. So this is a nice your basic medium dice simple cooking. That's that. The parsnip will get the exact same methodology. Good. A little peppery. Not surprising. All right, turnip. Yeah, what is this little critter? Something tried to get in there, spend its winter inside of a turnip. 
The turnip's really assertive, so we're not going to use all that much turnip. This one should be plenty. All right, and this is one of my all-time favorite little vegetables. And if I'm really ambitious, maybe I'll julienne some up and deep fry them. Celery X, so good. Makes a beautiful puree. You're seeing a lot of this on menus this time of year now. It's light as a feather and very, very white and silky. We'll dice this much. I don't have a mandolin here, so I'm going to try and cut this really thin and make a nice fine julienne and then deep fry that and use it as a garnish on top. It's kind of, they're really crispy and delicious and I'll see if I can get away with it. Come on, knife. You don't want me cutting my finger off in the middle of a show, do you? I'll save that till the end. And I'm just going to cut these in a nice little julienne. And we're going to deep fry these and sprinkle them across the top. All right, it's really, this is so simple. But again, it tastes great. So at the end of the day, that's all it is to me. Like, you know, Peter's food, again, I'm eating, eating, eating. It's not, not that this food's that simple, but I mean, it just wasn't as, like, like he said, you know, he's not using a lot of equipment. There's not a lot of foaming and dotting and evaporating and reconstituting and passing through tammies. And his craft isn't getting really good ingredients the best he can get, and that's what he does. And then figuring out what they're good for, cooking them the right way and not getting in the way. It's a really old school way of cooking, but you know, last time I checked, that was still a great, like, you know, Ferdinand Poin. Yeah, wasn't he a wonderful guy? That's still my school, so I'm with him. So this is just gonna be real, real simple, straightforward. I've got a flame under a pan, meet me over by the stove. I've just got a little bit of this wonderfully neutral grape seed oil. That's it. Like I said, I don't want a lot of color here, just simple. I think Peter Hoffman also mentioned, you know, we season food all during the way when we're cooking it, so a little salt in there now. A turn or two with a pepper mill. All right, now we're just gonna move them around a little. All right, lid on the pan. You know, that steams the steam, we're, we're, it's escaping, but that's what's really cooking these vegetables now. And there's the water that's been trying to escape, and that's the oil that's picking up all that lovely carrot color. So, there, and it's, you know what, it smells lovely. You could use an onion in here, but this is just straight root vegetables. I just like it, it's just straightforward, simple. Only about another five minutes. All right, let's see if we can do this. Beautiful tomato. And we're just going to squeeze some of that water out that I don't feel I need. You know, there's something about parsley. It just has a great clean kind of flavor. So I like the parsley and I like the tomato in this vegetable ragu just to sort of give it a, you know, a little more background on a little lightness. And I could have used lemon juice too rather than the tomatoes, but you got to love these San Marzanos because they, this is almost like just a simple tomato concasse. Add a little tomato to this mix. I've got these nice pitted Greek olives. So they're kind of cured, kind of briny, kind of pack a little bit of a salt punch. You know, I'm just thinking this is like, you know, almost northern Italy, southern France. It's the winter. They've got root vegetables. It's the winter. They've got olives and olive oil and garlic. And they've, these people, those people always put tomatoes up. So, part of a Provençal flavor profile. Chopped San Marzano tomato. Just fits right in color-wise. In my last pan here, a little olive oil. Nice non-stick pan to make this simple. Again, I want the skin nice and crispy. Let's just season the fish. You know, we're just like Peter said, and this is how chefs are, you just season, 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 because a lot of this, a lot of what I'm doing now ends up staying in the pan. When you're cooking fish skin side down, nice to make a little score. This keeps the skin from curling, otherwise you're gonna go chook, and you're, you're gonna not get, not only not get crispy skin, but you're gonna get curly skin. So just every so many inches, make a little incision, just like that. And now we're ready to go. Away from you, so you don't splatter yourself or the cook next to you on the line. See the tendency of that to pop up like that? 
That's the skin reacting. All right, we're gonna deep fry a little bit of these. We've tested a couple of pieces. Do them in little batches. Always be careful you don't overload your fryer at home because that'll just, the oil will pop up over all over and make a mess. Yeah, it's good to flip. Nice and golden. Of course, we always, just before we go to use it, we'll just pass a knife through here. All right, we're just gonna get these. It's really nice. I don't have to use everything I made, but that's what this looks like. It's really pretty. And it's really, again, this is how healthy is this? Because there's no, not a lot of oil, just a little bit of oil in that pan that I put on it. Got our bass that's just set. One like this. And it's funny, this skin, I mean, I have to admit complete failure here. As soon as I put the fish in, I said, why'd the skin curl? I made these cuts. Usually that keeps the skin from curling. Sometimes I make two cuts, and maybe that's what I failed to do this time. Don't know. Now we're going to season our little celery fries with a little salt. In fact, the whole dish is going to see a little bit of salt. And if you wanted to hear, to go a little extra fancy, you could get fresh thyme leaves. To, as, you know, take thyme, pull thyme leaves off of the stem, fine chop them, and sprinkle them in here. If I was feeling like a real soigné guy, I would do that, but I'm not feeling so soigné. Sorry. But I'm going to get these guys, and I'm just going to kind of pile them up like this so we get a little elevation. And we're getting a little textural contrast, too. And we also have, now we have the celery flavor on the bottom, the celery flavor on the top. And that's pretty much what you got. It's simple. You know, again, in restaurants, you might do a little drizzle of olive oil around the outside because plates... People eat so visually now. It's not enough to have food taste good. You know, you really have to make food look amazing on the plates, and that's part of the job of a restaurateur. Part of it's the price you're paying, part of it's, you know, making the food sexy. But I do home cooking. This isn't restaurant-style cooking. If you wanted to get fancy, a little herb oil around the outside, a couple of dots of something, hold the foam. Um, let me get a fork and get in here. So we've got this crunchy little guys. These are irresistible. I love fried celery root. Let's get the head section of the fish, because this is the part I love to eat. Sorry, I'm gonna cut this backwards, but you can see it's just black bass, just set, beautiful, delicate fish flavor, little pieces of crunchy celery. Mm. This fish is sweet. And then this root vegetable thing, I'll tell you something, honestly, it's sweet. It's, there's just such sweetness in these, in these root vegetables. The carrots are really, really sweet. Parsnips are really sweet. Celery has a sweet. The only thing is turnips aren't terribly sweet, but there's this great vegetable. I mean, this is really the kind of stuff I'm eating all the time these days. Because where is, okay, I fried these. Now, I wouldn't do this at home. Would I put this on at home? Probably not, so I do it for TV. Take this stuff off, which there isn't a whole lot of fat in it anyway, and then tell me where the fat is on this plate. Vegetables are primarily steamed. Fish was sauteed, the oil stayed in the pan. <clears throat> it's low fat, it's steamed, it's delicious, it's fish. Tons of vegetables. I don't know. I don't know. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to call Peter Hoffman up when the show airs and say, what'd you think, Peter? No, I think he'd be okay with this. So Savoy, I love. Restaurants like that, I love. Uh, his new restaurant, Back 40, check it out. Avenue B, 12th Street. Much more casual, neighborhood hang. You know, very good food, very simple. But Savoy is a jewel. Go in there any time of day, any time of night. They've got a great, great weekend, great brunches. Um, it's just really, really super good, honest food from a guy that's got a fine mind and um, has been doing a great job for almost 20 years now, down on that corner of Prince and Crosby. Hey, where are we in the season? I don't know. I'll see you another week. I know that we have at least another show to do. So stay well, eat well at every occasion. Try this kind of stuff. You know, it works.